Hi everyone, welcome to video one of unit three, measuring motor behavior. The reading for this topic are the remaining pages in chapter two. We'll be looking at how we measure motor behavior by, uh, or through, I should say, something called a levels of analysis approach. This is simply saying that we're trying to understand human performance through more than one dependent variable. And remember that we have essentially three types of variables. We have an independent variable, which is type of variable manipulated by the scientist or the researcher. And we have a dependent variable, which changes due to the manipulation of the independent variable. So we're trying to see the effect of the manipulation of the independent variable through the dependent variable. And then we also have a confounding variable, which is a factor that unintentionally influences the dependent variable. Our course objective on the syllabus that relates to this topic is that the student will be able to describe methods for quantifying the measurement of movement and demonstrate the ability to select the appropriate type of measure based on the performance related information needed to address the specific goal. And of course, why is this important? Why do you need to know this? Well, the knowledge of the methods used in motor behavior research set the groundwork for understanding questions asked in the literature. And part of our discussion question is doing a mini literature review um, that looks at a motor skill of interest to you and how that may be evaluated based upon one of the techniques that we'll talk about today. The other reason why this is considered to be an important topic is that it is really important to obtain objective information about motor behavior in order to accurately assess and evaluate a skill. Accurate assessment and evaluation, regardless of what field you are in, is really, really important, whether that's for health and fitness purposes or perhaps physical education or Anything relating to human movement and progression, you have to be able to accurately assess and evaluate, and many of the methods that will be talked about today provide you with an objective way to do that, which is really the important piece of it. So what exactly do I mean by levels of analysis? Well, again, these are the dependent variables, but what are they specifically? Well, we have three levels. The first is movement outcome. This is really giving us some information about success or the effectiveness of a movement. In other words, it tells us the extent to which a movement achieves a goal that it was intended to meet. Whereas movement pattern characteristics are not really giving us much information about success per se, um, but they're primarily looking at more um, biomechanical as well as a muscular activity characteristics. And then our third level of analysis is central nervous system, specifically brain activity. So first let's take a look at movement outcome. Our first level of analysis, there are three components to movement outcome, error or error scores. Inversely, you could think of this as accuracy or lack thereof. We can also evaluate movement outcome in terms of time and speed, as well as magnitude. We'll be looking at each of these individually, first looking at error scores. Error scores are essentially giving us information about the degree to which an individual did not achieve a target. One way that we can evaluate error scores is by doing something to the data that's called blocking. So for example, let's say we had 15 trials of dart throwing. And instead of evaluating all 15 trials combined, we can separate the 15 trials into three blocks as you see on your screen. So trial one through five comprise block one, six through 10 is block two, and 11 through 15 is block three. In other words, there's five trials per block and there are three blocks total. Now, by doing this, we can individually evaluate each of these blocks and perhaps make comparisons um, over time, let's say with progress or improvement. So 
let's say we've blocked our data or perhaps there's not a lot of data and we don't necessarily need to block it, what do we do then? Well, we have a series of error scores that we can calculate about each block or each group of data, each providing us with slightly different information. Our first error score is called constant error. This is where we take the sum of our individual error scores and divide it by the number of trials. So E is equal to X sub I minus T, where our X value is the score on the trial and our T value is the target, the value of the target. And this is providing us, the value E is providing us with the magnitude of the error for each trial which is what block two and all the other blocks that we looked at, blocks one, two, and three, all already showed us this. They already showed us the E values for our dart throwing task. And then N is the number of trials in the block. So our number of trials for block two is five. And what I want you to do now is to pause the video and calculate what the constant error score would be for block two. To calculate the constant error score for block two, what we would have to do is to add all of the error scores in block two and then divide it by the number of trials. So if you were to do this, you would end up with a score of 2.2. I didn't put any units on here, but we could say that these error scores are in inches, for example, inches away from the target. So what does this information tell us? Well, it tells us the average magnitude and direction of the deviation relative to the target. In other words, it's essentially a mean score. It's what we're getting. One of the unique things about constant error is that it considers the relative signs of error. In other words, we don't discount the negative values for our negative error scores or the positive values for our positive error scores. You might be wondering why there may be a negative error score. How do you have negative error? That doesn't mean increased accuracy. That's simply one way to distinguish between, for example, if the darts were thrown above the bullseye we could say those were positive, and the darts thrown below the bullseye, those could be considered negative, for example. So because we consider the relative signs of error, whether the value of error is positive or it's negative, we can ask one question about this now, which is, does the performer have a general tendency? In other words, does the performer generally respond by let's say undershooting the target, which would provide a negative value, or overshooting the target, which would provide a positive value. Um, or if we relate it to another type of task, uh, let's say for something relating to speed, is, it, is a performer performing too slow? Are they performing too fast, etc. So we can ask this question, is there some type of performer response bias? That's what we get in terms of the information from the constant error. And again, it is considered a mean score. It's calculated exactly like you would calculate, calculate an average. Our second type of error score is called variable error, where we take the square root of the sum of the square difference between each individual error score and the constant error for that block. And then we divide that value by the number of trials in the block, where again, E is the magnitude of error for each trial, N is the number of trials in the block, and CE, of course, is constant error. So I, what I would like you to do, again, is to pause the video and calculate the variable error for block two, again, using the constant error value that we just calculated of 2.2. So in order to calculate our variable error score, we'd have to go through a number of different steps. You would take the value in each of those trials and subtract it by the constant error score of 2.2. Whatever value that ends up being, that has to get squared. So then you have each of these individual values for trials 6 through 10. Those get summed, 
and then you divide by five because we have five trials in the block and then that number gets squared. So if you had gone through those steps you would have ended up with a number 3.75 roughly. And what does this value tell us? It tells us the inconsistency of responses across a series of trials. Um, one way that you can interpret this information is that it shows us the measure of spread around a subject's own average. In other words, we're looking at the variability of the trials within the block. So one could describe it also as the standard deviation of constant error scores, except that you'll find that if you simply calculate standard deviation for the five trials in this block that you will not end up with 3.75. So although it can be described in this way, it is not exactly the same calculation. Now our error scores of constant error and variable error are both very informative. However, their individual values should not be taken out of context. More than one error score generally is calculated to get a better overall view for the trends in the information. So this image, which is from the text, figure 2.4, uh, gives us a good example of this concept. Um, this is data taken from another researcher in the early 1950s and a very basic question is posed to show us why it's important to consider both constant error and variable error when you're analyzing accuracy. So our question here is which marksman appears to be more skillful? And essentially what this individual was trying to show was the relative importance of constant error as well as variable error. So if we look at marksman A on the left, you can see that there's quite a large spread of the trials around the bullseye. As a result of this large spread, this person has a large variable error. Remember the variable error is essentially the standard deviation um, of the constant error scores. But the constant error itself is considered small, basically because the constant error is essentially a mean score. So because this individual was all over the place, the errors canceled themselves out. There's some negative errors, which we would consider below the bullseye, and some positive errors that are above the bullseye, and they sort of cancel each other out. So you end up with a small constant error. Whereas the marksman on the right, marksman B, has a very small variable error because there is very little variation between trials for the shooting task. However, because all of the trials are bunched together very tightly, fairly far away from the target, this person has a large constant error. The value of the error score, for example, would all be negative and as a result, none of them would cancel each other out. But it's fairly obvious when you look at Marksman B that even though the cluster of trials is not very close to the bullseye, um, only a very slight modification would allow for the clustering to be much closer to the bullseye. In other words, Marksman B would consider to be more accurate um, because there is very, very uh, large consistency in the distance from the target, whereas the uh, marksman on the left is a little more erratic. In other words, the variable error doesn't depend on whether or not the subject was close to the target. And the reason why is because, remember that variable error is measuring the spread about the subject's own scores. Total variability is our third error score. And total variability is fairly easy to calculate because we've already calculated constant error and we have already ca calculated variable error. So we square the constant error value and add it to the square of variable error and we take the square root. So again, I'd like you to pause the video and calculate this value. So if you were to go through the steps to calculate our total variability, the value you would have um, come up with was 
So what does this tell us? This is essentially telling us the total amount of spread of responses about the target. In other words, because it's a combination of both the constant error, which is essentially our average or mean value, and our variable error, which in a sense is equivalent to standard deviation, this provides us with a overall measure of success in achieving the target in terms of biasing, as well as consistency for this performer for our specific block that we calculated the constant error and variable error scores for. Um, just for your own reference, another term that's used to describe this um, in the literature is root mean square error. And our last error score is absolute error. Absolute error is very similar to constant error aside from one major difference, which is that we take the absolute value of each of our error scores for each trial we sum those values then and divide it by the number of trials. So instead of adding five plus negative two plus negative three plus four plus six, we would do five plus two plus three plus four plus six and then divide that value by n. So this goes, gives us the average magnitude of error across a series of trials which is why it is considered to be another measure of overall accuracy, except the main difference compared to constant error is that we don't include the relative sign of error. In other words, because we do not do that, we are not given information about the respect to the direction of deviation relative to the target. So we do not receive any information about biasing with respect to this value. So if you were to calculate the absolute error for this block of trials, you would have ended up with a score of four, meaning four units or four inches in our example, um, which means that the individual on average was four inches away from the target or the center of the bullseye. However, we know that this isn't really a true reflection of the person's overall performance because our constant error score was 2.2, meaning that on average, when you took into consideration biasing or the performer's tendency or tendencies, our value was much smaller. So you really get a better sense for which way a person is throwing the darts in our example with our constant error score. Whereas the absolute error just tells us essentially how much error there occurred, period, but with no respect to biasing.